chocolate. 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 From Dame Cacao, I'm Max Gandy, and this is Chocolate on the Road, the show where we explore hot topics surrounding cacao and chocolate cultures around the world. So let's hit the road. Chocolate is a staple in many people's lives. It's a special treat, a favorite flavor, a childhood memory. But on the other side of that food is a fruit, and the farmers who grow it. Located in the humid tropics, most all cacao-growing countries are also considered developing countries. For centuries, these cacao farmers have shipped their cacao beans to more temperate climates, usually to be made into chocolate. Most of them had no idea what people did with their cacao beans. Because why would they? It's just another crop, like apples or coffee. And that's still how it is on most farms. Over the last ten years or so, however, this has changed in a few places. Some cacao farmers have started to add value to their cacao crop at home, making chocolate from cacao tree to chocolate bar. In the craft chocolate industry, we're always talking about two things. More money to farmers, and the craft of chocolate making. When executed thoughtfully, tree-to-bar chocolate can accomplish both of these things, as well as empowering farmers to control their own narratives, in their own words. That's what today's episode is about, telling their story of tree-to-bar chocolate from farmers' mouths to our ears. The thing I realize is when you already have a product, you now have a story to tell about how this product came to be and where it all started. This is Wit Holganza, a cacao farmer in Davao City, the cacao capital of the Philippines, a country in Southeast Asia. In February of 2019, I traveled to the Philippines. I spent the bulk of my time in Davao City, which is the main city in the Mindanao Island region, the southernmost island group in the Philippines. There, I found two distinct but related chocolate stories. One is about growing cacao and the process of making chocolate from tree to bar, but the other relates to the growing interest in agrotourism on cacao plantations. Wit, the woman you just heard from, uses her cacao to make products for the local market. But Wit's going beyond tree to bar chocolate, so we'll be coming back to her farm a little bit later in the episode. To begin our story of creation, first, there must be new life. My father-in-law, he went to the farm and planted a cacao tree for my husband when he was born because, according to him, my son will grow in a cacao plantation and someday he will be a cacao farmer. I'm Ayet. I'm in charge with Rosario's Delicacies, Rosario's Chocolate. And I'm Nell. I'm in charge in the farm and in fermentation of the cacao beans. Tell me about your farm. Where is it located? How big is it? Okay, our farm is located in the Kalinan area. It's in Davao City. Davao City is located in the island of Mindanao. That is the southernmost island of the Philippines. The history of Ayet and Nell's farm goes back even further than the tree Nell's father planted in 1978. The couple didn't start making chocolate bars from their family's cacao until 2016. It was actually only because of a scholarship to study at Ghent University that Ayet was even able to learn how to make chocolate. Nell's father had actually been doing the same thing with their cacao for decades. The same thing everyone else was doing. During that time, we were already making tablea. They started making tableya early 80s. Mm. And what's tableya? It's a chocolate drink. It's made of cacao mass. Uh, it's different from what the Mexicans make because the Mexicans add spices. While tableya is just cacao mass. We don't add anything. We don't remove anything. We just mm. make it in little a paste and boil it with sugar and milk, sometimes without milk. This history of processing cacao into tablea has given Filipinos a unique connection to cacao, but not so much to chocolate. When I was a kid, first time when my uncle that 
worked in the U.S. gave us chocolates. And my dad told me, Oh, that, that, that thing you're eating, that chocolate, it was Hershey's at, at that time. He said that that was made with, it was made with cacao beans. And I was surprised when I thought, I thought cacao beans was just for tablea. So what I did is, when I read the, the ingredients, the very prominent things were milk, cacao mass, and sugar. I tried to get melted cacao liquor, and I added sugar and milk powder, and I just mix it. And when I cooked, tried to taste it, it was I was disappointed, really, <laughs> because it, it didn't taste close to to the chocolate I was eating. A child's attempt at baking. Yes. <laughs> You know, uh, I was really maybe seven years old at that mm. time. At that time, I was really uh, wondering how they made chocolate. From your father's first cacao tree that he planted in honor of you, what is the process of growing cacao like? What does a cacao seed look like when you're putting it into the ground? Actually, the, the cacao seed is, you have to treat it first before you plant it. Because you have to to clean the mucilage first. So, so there's that, this white mucilage. Yes, there is a white mucilage. And you have to clean that so that it would uh, be coached to grow. Because if you don't remove the mucilage, it would prevent the seed from germinating. So the the white pulp surrounding the seed helps with fermenting the cacao, but it hurts with growing with, the Yes, cacao. with germination. Mm. There's this little almond size, maybe one centimeter, two centimeters Yes, around long. like that. Yeah, and it's covered in white pulp. Yes. You wash off the white pulp, yes. and then you plant it in the ground. We wash it, we wash it, then we scrub it with sawdust mm. so that to remove the mucilage. Then uh, we plant it in in seedling bags to let it grow first. Nell is extremely knowledgeable about cacao farming. He even studied horticulture during university. He explained to me that the seeds, which become seedlings once they sprout, are a lot like children at first. They need lots of love and attention. But once the seedlings reach around 13 months old, they'll need to be grafted. What is grafting? Grafting is where you get a scion from a parent tree so or a, a clone, yes, so that you can get the characteristics of the mother tree and transfer it to the rootstock. So you choose an ideal branch from a tree that's producing well, but you want more of that. Nell answered all of my many questions about grafting, and at its core, it's a form of human selection. In order to avoid the unknown genetics of the seedlings they've been pouring resources into, they perform a branch transplant of sorts. They carefully select a branch from a well-producing tree, cut a V into each of the branch and the seedling, and then tie the two together. Eventually, they become one. That's a very simplified version, but it's a pretty standard practice on farms. Once the newly grafted trees are planted, for the next two years they're kept out of direct sunlight. The trees which shade them are called nurse trees or just shade trees. Common nurse trees are banana or coconut. These also provide income to farmers, while the baby trees aren't yet producing cacao. So once the tree is three years old, what happens so that the cacao pods begin to grow? During the three years, you have to properly prune it and shape the tree to your ideal fruiting branches. You should properly space the branches so that the fruits would have space and the leaves would have a proper spreading pattern. After that, when you have fruits around uh, maybe two centimeters of diameter, here in the Philippines, we used to bag the fruit because uh, we have a problem here, especially in the Mindanao, a pest called pod borers. How long does it take from a flower to a fully grown pod? Around six months. And how do you know that a pod is ripe? Uh, it depends on the, in some varieties, there's a color change, but in some varieties, we count the days. My workers would also uh, knock on the fruit 
if it's a li little hollow it's right if it's not hollow it's uh unripe so we leave it and let it ripen again for another week so the hollowness comes from the seeds inside being a little bit looser yes so once the pods are ripe how do you harvest them uh we use a selector knife it's like a curved knife and we carefully cut the the stem of the fruit and we carefully uh cut it not to damage the flower cushion because uh, if it's damaged it won't bear fruit anymore it would be blind in that part and where do the fruits grow on the trees usually it grows on the branches especially in the older branches if you take care of the flower cushions <laughs> How long does a cacao tree usually live? Uh, actually, it can live uh, uh, more than 50 years, 60 years, because I've seen cacao trees growing here more than 60 years. So once you harvest with the selector knife, what do you do with the pods? After that, what we do is we cure the pods for around three to five days so that uh, if there are some fruits that are a little bit immature that was harvested, it would mature a little bit when we break it. We remove all the seeds. If it's in a ripe condition, it will be easily removed. We have a different process for the damaged beans from the good beans. What do you do with the damaged beans? Uh, we dry it directly and sell it for bulk chocolate. After that, we place it in a fermentation box and uh, we line it with uh, banana leaves because the banana leaves has natural uh, microorganisms that uh, helps in fermenting the cacao. Fermentation? Yeah, you heard correctly. Chocolate is a fermented food, just like kimchi or vanilla. When the cacao is first put into the fermentation boxes, it smells fresh and slightly acidic. Floral like lychee, but bright like strawberries. All of that quickly melts away, however, as things begin to heat up. For fermentation, you have, you develop the precursors, the ability of the cacao beans to taste like chocolate, to taste the earthiness, the fruitiness. It will depend on how you ferment it. During our fermentation, after putting it in the fermentation box, we let it stay for around 48 hours without mixing. As much as possible, we don't introduce air in the pile. You provide an anaerobic environment in that pile. Microorganisms produce uh, alcohol in that state in the first two days. And after that, in the third day, when you start to mix, you can really smell the alcohol that has been produced. What does it smell like? Like sweet alcohol, like sweet wine. Yeah, like a sweet, like white wine. Yeah. When you mix it in the third day, you introduce oxygen and the alcohol would start to turn into acids like vinegar and lactic acid, acetic acid. And the acids are some of the, the chemicals that help give cacao beans their flavor. You have to be careful on how or when to mix it because it, it really affects how much oxygen you introduce. Every day, after the two days, you have to mix it to introduce oxygen. And you have to transform all those alcohols into acids. And there's a certain point when you can get the flavor that you want. You have to remove the beans or else you will over-ferment your beans. And you would lose all those uh flavor precursors that will make, turn it into a good tasting chocolate. Why is there such a large range, six to eight days? It will depend on the weather because sometimes if it's rainy, fermentation takes a little slower. Sometimes it's if it's dry, it's warmer, fermentation is faster. About how much cacao do you ferment in one go, in one batch? Uh, usually during the season, our one pile would reach around 500 kilos to 600 kilos. But during the off-seasons, it's a little smaller, around 80 kilos. But it's easier to ferment a bigger pile compared to a smaller pile. For a smaller batch, 
you will not get the optimum flavors that you would like. And how hot does it get inside of the fermentation boxes? Sometimes 55, 55 Celsius. Sometimes it might go higher around uh, 60. But usually after mixing, it goes around 40 to 45. That's like 110 degrees, 40 to 45, 110 degrees Yes. Fahrenheit. Once fermentation is finished, the cacao needs to be dried, preferably in direct sunlight. Like long tables. And yes, yes. And it's made of bamboo slats where air can pass up and down. And Do you just dump it on there? In the first day, we dump it a little thicker so that uh, there's a little bit of micro-fermentation going on. And on the second day, we spread it thinner so that it would start to dry. But for that, we, if we can, we, we would mix it every four hours so that it would uh, prevent the beans from clumping together. The drying stage is sort of make or break for farmers. Do it too slowly and mold begins to form. But do it too fast and your beans trap too much of the acid they produce during fermentation. For most tropical climates, four to eight days is necessary for drying. Farmers aim to bring beans down to 7% moisture content before storage. It's after all of this work, phases one and two, harvest and post-harvest, that most farmers send their beans to a chocolate maker. Here, Ayeth is their chocolate maker. And her first job? Sort her husband's carefully processed beans. We separate the the larger beans and the smaller beans, and then we roast it. We have this a drum roaster, a drum roaster. so like a coffee style roaster. Yes, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. about twenty kilogram capacity. We How have... long do you roast your cacao for? Uh, it depends on the beans. Actually, her feeling and the smell and the size of the beans and the and the sound. Because uh, during the roasting, so he said some some uh, you know some time the respect, and then after he feels the because it also depends on the moisture content of the beans. So twenty to twenty five minutes. So compared to the fermentation and drying, it's a much faster step. Mm. Yes, roasting is a critical step or stage for chocolate making or tablaya making because uh, during roasting because during fermentation you develop the precursor for chocolate flavor but during the roasting it's developing the chocolate flavor so there's a chance that you might over roast the beans and it will turn into burnt paste so it, it's not good for chocolate or for tablaya just like burnt coffee, you can have burnt cacao beans. Yeah, so the flavor profile, the flavor profile will be can, so it's not good for chocolate. So the fermentation process is nothing if the roasting is not very good. So the cacao beans are roasted and then... After the roasting, we put the electric pan to cool the process. Do you stir the beans? Yes, we stir the beans. And then after some cooling, uh, we we know it. We know it is this is a separation of the shell and the cacao nibs. Each cacao seed actually has an additional shell on the outside, which is fibrous and not very flavorful. So winnowing is the step during which each shell is removed from the beans. Most makers use a machine for this, but it can be done by hand. However, the traditional winnowing process here in the Philippines is using a native uh, it's like a native basket and then you just do it uh, you panic, shake it you up shake and it. You, the beans bounce yes and then the it separates the beans and the shell but here in our facility we don't use that native basket we use stainless plate for hygienic purposes the result of this winnowing is cacao shells and cacao nibs The shells are traditionally used as fertilizer, while the nibs are turned into chocolate. What do you do with these cacao nibs to turn them into chocolate? After the winnowing, 
since the nibs are already ready, we use the, our grinder that is first grinding. After the grinding, we put it into a melanger. We're talking about uh, chocolate, right? Yeah. Not the tablaya. Tablaya is 100% chocolate, but the process is different from eating chocolate. And how long is the cacao in the melanger? Depends on the particle size that you want. But our melanger can uh, achieve the 30 microns only, 30 to 35. It's about 30 to 48 hours. And the capaci our capacity is only 6 kilograms. So what is the texture, the mouthfeel, and the particle size of the beans when they're just ground, before they're put in the melanger? It's really grainy. It's pretty. Really so, gritty. Mm -hmm. But yeah, still, the chocolate paper is still there, mm. but still gritty. And mm. when do you add the sugar and cocoa butter, maybe milk powder for milk chocolate? Once I put the cacao, uh, we call it cacao mass, mm. we just add uh, the coconut sugar or the cane sugar with coconut butter. We with, just mix with it. With the cocoa butter? Mm. We just mm. mix it. So once, all the, once the chocolate is refined in the melanger, what do you do with it to prepare it for sale? After 30 hours, I use my tongue as a measure to measure the particle size. Particle size and a host of other factors are all part of the crux of making chocolate. What type of machine do you use? How fast to grind? For how long? And this is just one step of chocolate making. It continues with tempering. A series of heating, cooling, and then heating the chocolate. Tempering brings the majority of the cocoa butter into its most shelf-stable form, so that it keeps its flavor and shape for as long as possible. After tempering comes molding, chilling the bars if you're in the tropics, and then packaging. Phase 3 is complete. Phase 4 begins with the marketing and selling of the chocolate, itself worthy of a separate episode. We're consumers. Now that our chocolate is made, we can enjoy it. But for Ayet and Nell, there are more ups and downs to contend with. What are your favorite and least favorite parts of Trita Bar chocolate making? My most favorite thing in the Trita Bar chocolate making is when we have new equipment. Because I really love tweaking equipment. But the really limiting thing is the budgeting. Because I really love when I go to research or to see new equipment when I see in Europe there's really good ball mills and melangers really gets me excited but challenge here in the Philippines is how you can afford those kinds of equipment how to have equipments like that being unable to afford new equipment is common in small batch chocolate making but most treated bar chocolate makers are located in developing countries where the local market cannot support $10 chocolate bars, or sometimes even $2 chocolate bars. It makes saving up for new equipment seem impossible at times. But despite the challenges, they wouldn't do it if they weren't getting positive feedback on all levels. They would say, wow, this is... They would be surprised that this is made in the Philippines. Uh, it really uh, gives joy to our hearts. Uh, the good thing with the Trito Bar is you are able to manage or your own fermentary. You have your own protocol for fermentation. You have your own protocol on on drying. And you have your own protocol on how to process the time. And the most important thing is you have the passion on making your chocolate. And once you have the passion, the result of the product that you're making is really good. Not all Trita Bar chocolate is created equal, but Ayet and Nell offer important insight into chocolate making, not only in country of origin, but on farm of origin. A related stream of income for cacao farmers is something I'd characterize as the fifth phase of cacao production, for the fine flavor market at least. That's agro-tourism. Ayet and Nell have dabbled in offering tours, but their farm just isn't set up for it right now. So for agrotourism, we travel just a few kilometers down the road to Gran Verde Family Farm. 
Remember that clip of a woman at the beginning of the show, Wit Holganza? She's the woman we're here to see. Wit has been managing her family's farm for the last 19 years. The best word to describe Wit is effervescent. We sat on cushions in a small circular room constructed next to her open-air kitchen. So please pardon any background noise. After a few cups of her housemate Tablea, I asked Wit what she's been doing with her cacao. Uh, for the cacao, I make cacao nib granola and sweetened cacao nibs. Pretty soon I'll be putting out 100% pure dark chocolate. For the other crops in the farm, particularly the other fruits like uh, mangosteen, durian, and rambutan manzones, as well as the vegetables, I sell this directly to uh, either consumers or partner restaurants, farm-to-table restaurants. But this farm has been around since the 1960s. Back then in my parents' time, they were leasing out the land to contract growers for pineapple and bananas. And uh, when we took over, we slowly planted mango trees, other fruit trees like durian, rambutan, lanzones. And uh, in 2008, inspired by the success of Charita Fuentespina of Malacos Gardens, um, I started buying seedlings from them and initially just would have enough money to buy 100 seedlings. And then slowly I learned how to cultivate by opening up my own cacao nursery, propagating uh, seedlings from seeds. And that's when I started to really speed up as far as planting is concerned. So I currently have now uh, close to 3,000 trees, uh, many of which are actually propagated uh, through our own uh, cacao nursery. Yes. So beyond the cacao that you grow on your plantation as, or your farm, as well as the other fruits, how have you been preparing your property for tours and how is it different from nearby farm? We started kind of like opening it up to the public by doing cacao training classes, cacao farming technology classes. So we would have groups of anywhere from 4 to about 12 people coming over to learn it. And they wanted to take a look at the farm. They didn't just want to learn about cacao. They wanted to look at the other crops that we've planted here. So it was pretty much a standard thing that they would take a short tour of the farm before we sat down to classes and learn specifically about cacao farming technology. So I guess uh, when we realized that that was the behavior of many people who come to the farm to learn, not just about cacao, but also to learn about how the other crops are affecting uh, the cacao farming, uh, that, that's the, the idea of a, a farm tourism took off. And um, when we invited people here to when they first knew that we had products already. So the thing I realized is when you already have a product, you now have a story to tell about how this product came to be and where it all started. So, you know, coming full circle with that realization, I thought that three years ago when we started making cacao nib granolas, we started slowly introducing the idea of would you like to learn about where this cacao granola comes from? And I was pretty excited to do the farm tourism side of it because a lot of the ingredients that go to our granola, we have it in the farm. We have mangoes uh, that go into our tasty yellow mango and green mango granola. We have coconuts, uh, which, re which goes to cocoa sugar because we have two lines. We have a regular line of granola and we have the healthy, healthier line, which uses coconut sugar and coconut syrup. It's kind of like, you know, piecing the pieces of the puzzle together. And so we have a story to tell about where uh, the products come from and how do we farm the ingredients to be able to create a great combination of a product uh, that goes into our granola. So um, the people who come here to visit are very interested about uh, not just being able to taste uh, the cacao nib granola or even chocolate or even just drink the tablea. They want to know how a cacao tree looks like, how a fruit looks like, where does it start, the flower and all that. They want to taste the fresh cacao fruit. So when we started doing that kind of a template, people were getting interested, more and more interested. The idea that they could actually grind their own tablea was really interesting for them. So that I, I feel that... Uh, being able to do cacao farm tourism is really, really exciting, especially because Davao is slowly gaining popularity. It's slowly building a reputation for having good quality beans. And so telling the story of where this good quality bean come from is really, just really, really exciting. Yeah. 
What kind of visitors do you usually get on your farm tours? Where are they coming from? You know, initially we had we had more of the non-Filipinos foreigners coming and being more curious about cacao and chocolates more than Filipinos, because the Filipinos, um, they you know their 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 focus wasn't so much on chocolate bars. Their focus was on tableya, the drinking chocolate. And 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 I think slowly now that more and more uh, tableya makers are also making fine artisanal chocolate bars, I think that's that's when it started catching everyone's attention that hey, uh, a lot of these farms or a lot of the processors already make chocolate bars and they're not bad. They're really good. They're good too. So initially, nobody was interested about you know where the tableya came from. You know, the charm and the enchantment with chocolate is different from the enchantment with tablea. And really, you as a typical Filipino, they don't like dark chocolate so much as well as milk chocolates. Yeah. They have a strong preference. Yeah. 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 So how to bridge that gap? I think that's a sweet spot right there to be able to, you know, send literally yeah. a sweet chocolate spot right there. So... Yeah. In terms of offering the the tours of the farm, I know you said this morning you had 54 visitors yes. on the farm. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as an extension of the process of making tree to bar chocolate, tree to bar tablea, or is it completely separate business? I think doing the farm tourism thing is going to be a way forward to be able to bridge that gap. Because um, last Saturday, I had a 10-year-old kid and when he saw the fruit, the cacao fruit, he said, What do you mean to say, if I eat chocolate, I'm actually eating fruit? I said, voila, that's exactly what you're doing. You're eating fruit because chocolate comes from the cacao fruit. And this is a child who's put it so simply, but that's what it is. And a lot of people have that disconnect that, you know, okay, it's a fruit. You make it into chocolate. And we have a lot of those trees here. We have a lot of those trees here. So what's been the process of developing the tours themselves? How have you worked out what parts of the farm to show, what information to share? Because there's a lot to share about agriculture. Okay. Um, well, when I showed you the farm development map earlier, it wasn't meant for tourism. I just wanted to build an entire ecosystem that would be sustainable. And then I realized that every time I added a feature that will complete the ecosystem, it was actually by itself an interesting facet of the farm, which people uh, may want to learn about and experience. So um, completing that farm development map, such as having this homestead, that vegetable terrace, the fruit part, the fruit tree part, the orchard part, the vegetable growing part, the you know the a meditation spot, the, uh, and you know all that all that thing. It it's taken a long time. It's taken a lot of years, a lot of patience because uh, we try not to buy the materials from outside. We try to use as much of materials as we need, and we take it from the farm. So it's a pretty slow process, apart from the fact that there's a challenge as far as finances are concerned, capital-wise. We need to put in a lot of investment. So have you had to hire more people on the farm in order to be able to run these farm tours? Not just for the farm tours. I hired more people to be able to develop certain parts of the farm. The farm tour is a secondary uh, concern because uh, we told ourselves the vision is not to operate like a resort. The vision is to actually operate a working farm which people will be interested to visit. So we will not just prioritize farm tourism over farming and producing crops. It's the, the main core will still be producing crops, crops that are healthy enough, interesting enough, tasteful enough for people to come and want to see how it's grown. And that's the, the farm tourism side of it. And do you think 
that your farm before, maybe four or five years ago, was a pretty typical farm in this area? It was. It was a typical farm until we started also collaborating with an environmentalist who would come and teach us about natural farming. Because with natural farming, you get to kind of like link everything. Everything is connected. Why are we planting more flowers? We're planting more flowers because we want natural pollinators, insects, midges, mm -hmm. to be able to pollinate our fruit trees. And why are you, you know, why why do we need to have uh, contours? Why do we have to do contouring? And that's also an interesting facet of why, you know, people are asking, why so many stakes all around? It looks like a mini rice terraces and all that, I said. But, you know, really just connecting the dots, every dot has a story. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do you think that other farmers nearby in the Philippines or even in other countries where there are tree to bar operations or where people are cultivating cacao could also work on cultivating an agritourism sector of their business and if so how do you think they could go about doing that i think the agritourism side of it is only a result of having a very very clear vision of how you want your how you want to create the farm so i'm for me personally i'm not creating the farm for farm tourism I'm creating the farm in such a way that the natural result is people wanting to see how it's being done. And I think that far more is a sustainable approach, more than looking at farm tourism as an income generating uh, uh, avenue for farmers. That is just a result of doing good practices, taking care of the land, taking care of every being, telling the story that it's so important to respect every living thing. Sustainable, holistic, and thoughtful have become buzzwords in recent years, but I'm hoping that they also become prerequisites for anyone entering the agritourism sector. This applies beyond chocolate and cacao, but it's something I wholeheartedly expect to see more of over the years and on the road. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chocolate on the Road. If you liked it, please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes, and share it in any way you see fit. Your support means so much, and it really does keep me motivated. I love sharing the stories and experiences of a range of brilliant guests, but honestly, this episode and a few others would simply not exist without the help of Ken and Sheila reyes Lau, who took me all over the Vow City. So an especially tremendously huge thank you to both of them, as well as today's guests, Ayeta Nell and Wit. To learn more about our guests, check out the show notes of this episode in the link in the description or on my website at damecacao.com. That's D-A-M-E-C-A-C-A-O dot C-O-M. Have a wonderful day, and I hope you'll join me next time we go on the road.